possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. Oh, and there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello, welcome to the RTE GA podcast, Mikey Stafford here, this is our big hurling preview show, Rory is with me as always and we have Liam Sheedy, uh, formerly Tipperary manager by twice, and Philip Lanigan of the Irish Day Mail and the Irish Mail on Sunday, how are you doing lads? Good Mikey, good, good, Mikey. good stuff lads, um, it's, uh, it's nice to be talking about the hurling championship, if as I said on the football podcast yesterday, a little strange to be talking about it before Easter. Um, Liam, um, the round robins are back, and I think everybody is is quite excited about that. So I, I just it'd be interested to get your take. Obviously, your first your first run as Tipperary manager was the traditional championship, and your second run was the round robin. So I think started with the round robin. Um, how did you find it? How did you have to adapt to it? How do you think players took to it? Do you think it's a success? Yeah, no. Look, it takes it takes a lot of planning. Um, you know, I suppose look. You know, you're getting four matches in really quick succession. You know, it's four and six. But, I mean, you know, there were times there where teams were being asked to play three weeks in a row. So, like, it was really, really heavy load. Um, so, but we, had, we had a good build-up to it. So, you know, we had, we had a bit of time and space to build in. Where some, some counties are now coming into a round robin after a two-week break. Some of them after a three-week break. So, you know, and I think I think throughout, the, throughout it, Mikey, you know, like, it's like training two panels. So, you'll have the guys who, the week, who you know, who after playing, if you've got 15 guys who have, you know, got or close on 70 minutes of action. Like, you're not going to train them the same way as you train maybe the, the remainder of the 15 or 20 that's on the panel. They're like, so it's like having two different groups and operations. So, logistically and planning, and you know, so you got to take recovery and stretching and flexibility is the lead option for the main 15. Whereas, you know, looking for someone to put their hands up is the main option for the other, for the other guys. So, you might be having 8 v 8 or 9 v 9 games, which are really, really intense. Um, so that managing of that is really, really important. And then you sometimes you got to manage the emotions as well. So you've got maybe you can have the highs of winning your first round and trying to manage that, or you've got the low of uh, not getting the results in the first round. And now you feel it's back to the wall. And how do you manage that? Because you might have a turnaround in six or seven days. So it's 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 really full on. But I think it's wonderful. I love the idea of the round robin. I love the idea that kids get to see their own heroes in their own in their own stadiums. Uh, two, two times a year I think that's a big plus but I do think it's really really compact I think that you know if you had a little bit more space between league and championship ideally and just give it a little bit more if we got a few more weeks at the end I think it, it could be the, the perfect solution but I'd be a big fan of the round robin it's it's tough on teams it's tough on management to get the timing right but I, I certainly would be a fan and look I think when you see there's going to be 40,000 or more in, in Cork you'll probably have as many as can get in in, in Waterford even though I'd say the bulk of them would be Waterford people but you're going to have really, really big crowds around the con- uh, around the, around the matches. So you know that 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 will tell you if people are willing to go pay and go watch these matches. I think that that sends out its own message. Yeah, uh, it's an important thing what uh, Liam said there, Philip. Really, isn't it? From from the fan point of view, to be guaranteed matches in your home ground. Great example of this weekend, obviously, is Westmeath welcoming Kilkenny to Mullingar for the first time since I think 2006. I read this morning when they they yeah. when they got through to a Leinster semi final after shock in Dublin and obviously got soundly beaten, but they always knew they were going to be beaten. This was more about this was this was a, a showcase for hurling in a county that's dominated by football. Um, they're going to get a couple of those this year, um, and obviously for the Munster County as well, which are steeped in hurling. Still, to get two two championship games in Ennis in a year is is not normal for Clare, and like these are just great opportunities for to showcase hurling. To be honest, in the counties that perhaps don't need a showcase, but still, um, it is nice that hurling is kind of its window is a bit bigger than it was in the in the traditional uh, championship. Absolutely, I was actually thinking I was covered that game back in '06 uh, when Kilkenny came to town, and there was a brilliant carnival atmosphere. Like there was huge crowd came in um, from early doors. I remember it was actually very competitive uh, till about the hour mark. Like Westmead really put it up to Kilkenny. And um, Kilkenny threw on a um, threw on the bench, but I remember I think it was the likes of Henry. They were out on the pitch for nearly an hour afterwards, signing um, signing autographs. Um, I don't know was it pre selfie days or or not, but but there was it was absolutely brilliant advertisement. And but that was the one shot they had, and nobody knew right then that that was going to be the start. Actually, the very first match of 
to Kenny's four in a row run. And um, I don't know how that ended. Lee might talk about that, but, <laughs> but, clear, but, but clearly the, the round robin, um, it was, it's been coming for a while. I think even the Hurland Development Committee precursor to the Leams Committee, like Tommy Lanigan, they wanted it. Like the, the round robin has been um, brilliant for Hurling. The very first one, 2018, we ended up with arguably the greatest championship ever. I think by any metric, depth of games, you know, uh, the quality, uh, the comebacks, the amount of games, like Limerick, I think was at eight to, to win an All-Ireland equal the record. So this is what Hurling needs. Now, it is going to be slightly different this year. We chatted to Gerard Hegarty, and he didn't realise that Leinster as a 16 group. He kind of went, really? So clearly the players are in that bubble, but it is different. Um, so we have six teams in Leinster. Now, if you're being cold and ruthless about it, the five team groups are brilliantly competitive. No margin for error. It's two, two home, two way. 16 means, you know, it's a 3-2 split. So that home and away split could actually could be key but Hurling took the decision about being developmental which is massive so for the likes of West Mead or Leash are in it this year rather than maybe one team yo-yoing up or, or down the 16 is is for the bigger picture so I think it deserve, deserves a chance and I think I know even the likes of Brandon Cummins would have said being involved in Joe McDonough where there was 16 groups you end up with the same you know kind of same pattern of games anyway like it, it runs off so quickly so I look I think there's so much to look forward to yeah, uh, you've mentioned it, the six teams, which which brings me on to a point I wanted to discuss, Rory, which is, um, and one reason I had Philip on him, on here is I wanted a second Leinster man because we can get we can get very monster centric on this hurling podcast <laughs> sometimes, um, but I think Philip and I would both have to admit that there is a big brother and a little brother in the provincial championship and. Take Kilkenny, the outliers, out of it, and take Galway, the Connacht team, out of it, and you're, the next the next two cabs on the rank are Wexford and Dublin, and their record against Munster teams is not good. Wexford, you have to go back to twenty fourteen for their last win in the championship against the Munster team, and I think it's twenty fifteen for Dublin or twenty fourteen as well. Either way, they've gone between them. They've gone about eleven games in championship without a win against the Munster side. So a it speaks to a, a dearth of kind of top, top hurling counties in Leinster, which I think is, is nothing new. But from a competition point of view, are the likes of Clare and, shall we say, this year Tipperary being badly served by a provincial championship, which is which is stacked on one side and, um, shall we say, a little bit lighter on quality on the other? Yeah, possibly. But I suppose, I mean, you, you mentioned, um, like, I know... There, there would always be a perception, and I think it's widely accepted. Look, that Munster is more competitive. The standard is probably higher, and they're just the facts. I mean, if you like, uh, as Cusack, don't look Cusack once said to me. He said, "Just look how many times Munster teams have won the All Ireland in comparison to Leinster teams." You know, so it's just that's just kind of tradition and history. But at the same time, I mean, Liam would be perfectly placed to tell us how close Wexford ran Tipperary and I know it's a should have should have could have he also knows Tipperary. that that's a banned topic on the podcast so yeah right, right, right. Like <laughs> but like I know we're into I know we're into should have could have territory but I think you know and and look maybe that's a mental block I don't know where they, they might have with some of the monster teams and look it was one of those great hurling days again in fairness but um I don't necessarily see there being a huge disparity across both provinces with the top four, we'll say, in Leinster and um, the, the standard in Munster by and large. I think where Munster is definitely outstripping the other provinces, the main three contenders for me, and I think for most people that will actually contest the All-Ireland, not just Munster, are in Munster, which is Cork, Limerick and Waterford. Yeah. Would, you, would you ditch the Munster champions though, Rory? Because to me, the ultimate way of the most fair, the fairest model and the way it might end up in 10 or 20 years is you just ditch the provinces. Like Leinster isn't a Leinster province. It's a developmental province. You've Galway, Antrim, Kerry potentially, which kind of... Um, so, like, if you're being fair, yeah. you just you mix it up. You have an open draw every year with the top mm. 10 or 11 teams and you end up with Kenny against Limerick in the first round or Tip versus mm. Galway. And then you don't end up with that disparity where Munster feel that you've, you know, three of the current top best teams in, in one group in an unfair group so I don't yeah, know yeah. no I'm it is just, just, interesting yeah. Yeah. But just, from my, just from my perspective I, I, I wouldn't be for Ditch in Munster I would place a huge 
value on a Munster Championship. I mean, I, I was delighted when I in my first stint that we won that we won two Munsters in three years I was there. So we won eight and nine and obviously Cork whipped us in, in ten. Um, but certainly one of the disappointments I'd have of my second stint is that I never managed. I managed to get to two months of finals, but never managed to get across the line. I got I got halfway there one time, all right. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't quite get there. Um, Pip, but, uh, pipped at the I, line, I, I, Liam. I, yeah, <laughs> but I, I would place a huge value on that. Like I suppose I was there, we won it in 2009. And I think it was a 125 year uh, <laughs> celebration. And I remember, I remember Larry and the tourist lad saying, "Hey, we're not, we're we're walking off, we're not, we're walking down to town here. Um, this is a special moment. Like this is winning a monster title in our own backyard on the 125 years of the, the GA was founded of the GA yeah. in 1884s. Yeah, yeah, in Torles. So, like, I, I do think there's there's a lot of value. There's not many trophies these guys can play for. Um, and if you see the way that I suppose Tip celebrated their football victory. We see the way Cavan celebrated. Like there's something about the prevention. No, I I get the other point, but mm. it, I always looked at it. Philip that said, look, I'm getting four games. I'm getting two games at home and I'm getting two games away. And there's three of the five teams going to qualify into the knockout stages. If I'm not good enough and my team isn't good enough to get to the top three out of five, well, so be it. I'm probably better off saying, hey, cash in your chips and go and focus on next year. That yeah. would be my view. I get the point about the the gaps and the differences, but I would much rather retain it because I, as I said, I would regret that we didn't get a Munster medal because people value those medals. There's only really, they're the two big medals. I know there's the National League, but the mm. big two is your provincial That's, championship and um, you're, you're all out of it. That's a fair point, Liam, but to, I, I would agree with you. I'm kind of more of a conversation point. I think if you get away, get rid of the provincial championships, you've just got a second league. I, I think there's a lot to be said for the tradition and not just the Munster Championship, the Leinster Championships as well. But from your point of view, um, like there is like it, on paper, there is undoubtedly there's a difference in standards between the the average Leinster team and the average Munster team, shall we say, if you take the outliers Kilkenny out of it and if you take the Connacht team out of it. Have you any explanation for that have you any reason behind it is it is it down to the competition level of the monster championship the teams are kind of forged in that is there a style point of view or is it is it simply history is there anything you've ever been able to put your finger on or anything you've ever noticed in the terms of approach or style in difference between monster and leinster teams no no there isn't actually no i i haven't there, you know i suppose if we go back you don't have to go back too far to win you know, Wexford and Offaly were winning, were winning all Ireland titles. Uh, obviously, Kilkenny that's long enough. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's it, the Kilkenny were probably you know the greatest team in the last number of decades uh, to ever play the game. But you know, I think I think um, every county has has potential. But there's no doubt about it. Playing the better teams does does really bring on your level of performance. But like the round robin is only in really on um since in, you know since twenty eighteen. Two years. So, yeah. And, and our, yeah, so and if you're and like and so it was Canada for two years. So and if you remember back, the most exciting championship that year, I think Galway, you know, at half time, Galway were top of the group. Um, and by the time I got to full time, Galway were out of the championship. So yeah. like, you know, Galway Dublin Dublin came back and beat Galway and Kilkenny Kilkenny and Wexford were hovering. They were, you know, when they drew the match, they weren't sure are we in or are we out? And they ended up contesting the Leinster finals. So, you know, I I, I think sometimes we, we look maybe in it's holistic, but actually, if you dig a little bit deeper, um, I think there's good merit, and I don't think it is a really significant bias. But you know, the Munster teams are in a good place at the moment. You know, yeah. we've always spoken about three of them, you know, and Tip and Clear will say to themselves, if we can topple one of them, we're still in with a chance of getting out of this group. So it's, it's all to play for. Yeah, last, last point on this, and to you, Philip, I just wonder, I, I, I'm not a fan of sticking a sixth team in there in Leinster, I, I think the balance was good. Teams had a week off. Teams had the same number of home and away games. But also, from the point of view of Westmead and 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 Leash, like, not, I don't think Dublin and Wexford are really in a situation at the moment where they're looking over their shoulders, not going by league form. But if they weren't in as good a form as they were, you know, there should be some sense of jeopardy there. Um, you could argue there should be some sense of jeopardy for the Munster Championship as well, but that's another argument. And I just think we may end up with a kind of a Division One A, One B situation here where. There's no jeopardy for the for the better teams in in Leinster, and we're all, we're going to have this revolving door, which you know could involve Offaly, could involve Antrim, could involve the two teams who are there now. Uh, I just think it's a bit of a it's it's a bit of a bot job. I think. I wonder what you think. Um, no, I wouldn't. Say, I don't see how you can say there's no jeopardy because three teams, only three, are going through. So if we're I was more thinking the, going the other way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of of 
yeah. Um, there's a there's a bit of that, but obviously the top end still is going to be ruthlessly competitive. Um, and I think uh, there there is a sense that you kind of clearly there's a change in dynamic. You undercut a bit, as I said earlier. It's you know it's been ruthless about it. The two home, two way. You know, uh, it's it's you, we saw it with the divisions and um, group, group B in the league. You know where there was some mismatches. So we, we you know I think you will that will happen. But like the GA did, did weigh that argument. There are strong arguments for it, like developmentally. Like we're all wondering, you know, about the conversation about Leinster versus Munster mm. about trying to develop the game and that. The bigger picture is what's at stake now. And obviously those championship games like Leash were deprived of them after their brilliant run and just due to the pandemic. Like the idea of getting five games against the top opposition, to me, that's the only way you're going to try and build that bridge. So if there is, it, I think you're going to have to, I, I take your point, Mikey, that it's going to be a change dynamic. And there is this imbalance now. You've lent their months that aren't operating off the same principles in, in a sense, you know, with, with games and, and the manager will look at that and then kind of look at a run, you know, what happens when they meet our Leinster teams clearly by virtue of the extra game, different slightly timing the matches. Um, is that going to impact on their All Ireland chances? So look, I think wait and see. It it, it it is going to be it is going to be a slightly changed dynamic though, right? But I don't think I don't I don't get the idea that the, the idea there'd be no jeopardy because the top's going to be ruthlessly competitive and, and the the team that going down, that's a massive um thing as well. Yeah. Okay, uh, Rory, I suppose the, the theme for me heading into this championship is kind of Limerick, the absentee landlords um, there outside of winning. Uh, since since beating your shower in, convincingly in an All-Ireland final, their form line hasn't been great. The only team they've beaten are uh, Joe McDonough team, and yet they're probably still most people's favourite for the All-Ireland. Rightly so. Um, it, 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 I, I mean, I know Derek was on with us a couple of weeks ago and made the point that Wadford are the team to beat. I could see why he would make that argument, but at the same time, I think, look, for me, Limerick are the team. Until somebody beats Limerick, Limerick are the team to beat. Um, they've, they're going for three in a row. And I think that's really a big thing for them. I think that's really what they're going to be chasing down. There's, they'll have a few bees in their bonnet still that they'll want to, you know, that they just a few, like I think the defeat to Kilkenny in that semi final a couple of years ago. I think that rankles with them to a certain extent. I think the opportunity for a Limerick team to cement their place in history. I think John Coyley is a very keen student of hurling history, and I think these types of things, while he mightn't say it publicly. They are, you know, he would be very conscious of the the power of Mackey, the 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 weight of hurling history, the, the how teams have to kind of make hay when they do have a special bunch of players and really go after and win as much as they can. And I'd say all the eggs have been put into the championship basket. They timed their run perfectly last year. People were kind of mooting the same type of talk ahead of last year's championship as well, if we remember. You know, they were a bit wishy-washy in their form heading into that. And we all saw what happened then afterwards. No one really laid a glove on them, bar Liam in the first half of the Munster final, as he mentioned earlier. So I think the same, they've probably taken more or less the same approach this time around. The key question is, will they have that level of hunger and drive to keep going again? And as I said to you before, the one area of concern that I would have is they, are, they play a very abrasive form of hurling. They play a brilliant brand, but it is abrasive. It's, it's aggressive. It's physical. Mm -hmm. That takes its toll. And if you look at the personnel that they have been operating from, if you go back to John Kiley's first year in charge, which is five years, and five years is a long time, in inter-county hurling these days. I think I was looking at it again there last night, 11 of the starting 15. That night they got beaten by Kilkenny in a qualifier, 20 points to 17. 11 would probably start on Sunday in Parky Cueve. So, you know... That's and it would be more barring injury, I'd say, wouldn't it? Correct, yeah, yes. Yeah. So you, <coughs> you would have had, a, like, well, we don't know what the story is with Mike Casey. He may, may, may or may not start and... There's rumours going around about Kyle Hayes as well, but look, again, we 
I suppose we we're ignoring all rumors from now on. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, room, yeah, the yeah, rumors yeah, is yeah, here; rumors, they're rumors, less reliable yeah, than normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but look, I think ultimately they're the, they are the team to beat, and and until someone beats them in the championship, that remains the case for me anyway. Yeah, um, Liam, it is it's impressive the way John Kylie has kind of, I suppose, kind of like put all his eggs, as Roy said, in the in the championship basket to kind of to kind of fob off the league entire half fobbed off last year and then clearly e- either they fobbed off the league this year or there's something going horribly wrong with them which I don't think anybody thinks is the case it's it's kind of ballsy enough isn't it to kind of to kind of just kind of bank last year's form and say we'll do all our work on the training field or perhaps in a couple of challenge matches and and <laughs> we'll be we'll be ready we'll be ready to go in Parky Cueve against one of our biggest rivals in and our David. opening match yeah but I, th- I think you know I think if we go back to the, the previous league campaigns that John Kiley was starting with 12, 13 of his championship team. I know any time we played him, I was always taken by the fact that he's nearly coming full strength here. Um, and I think, you know, most of this year, we didn't see more than eight. So he literally played the league with half a team because I think it's back to Rory's point. He realises that 11 guys of his team were are on the road for five years or more. And he's realised that he looked at the calendar and said, OK, it's going to run the league, you know, it's going to run to a league, you know, did Limerick really need to get to a league final, have a two-week break and then, and then rock into a four-week, a four-match a four, a four uh, match full-on six-week programme and then try and re- reignite again for the next champ? So, like, that's where you got to look at the full breadth of the schedule. And I think he's, you know, he's called it and said, listen, my focus on the league is getting one or two players. Nobody will remember the fact that they went back to back in the league, but I'll tell you what, if he does three in a row, it'll be, it'll be a long time before it's forgotten. So he's very clear in terms of what he's going after. Himself and Paul Kinnerk are really, really smart. But I expect him to meet at least a stern challenge from the Rebels on Sunday mm-hmm. because, you know, I don't think the Rebels, I like coming out of, you know, you can say what you like, it's league is league, but I don't think Cork will be at all happy about their level of performance. But look, I was on the Sunday game that night and I watched it and I said, you know, Cork have shown much more in this league than they've shown in that game. You know, they went and they, you know, they won they won four games out of five. The last game they lost in the league stages is relevant really against um against Wexford. Wexford. But they, they had good form against Galway, they had good form against Limerick. After a poor start against Clare, they were really, really good. They're a pasty team. And I if Cork don't come up with something on Sunday, I'll be shocked because they're better than that in my view. Um, you know, they they got started in the final, they didn't fire. And, you know, that's not easy because going up to that stadium for your first time in a long time is, is not easy for any group of players. But I'm expecting them to come with something. Um, how much and will it be enough? Not really sure because, as you said, they're going in against what I consider to be still the, the, the best championship team in the country that, that we know right now. Um, but I think it's going to be an intriguing game. And I'm not surprised there's 40,000 there. And I'm not surprised Philip Lanigan is going down to cover because it is probably going to be the game where we're going to learn an awful lot about where Limerick are at and we're going to see exactly what the backbone of this Cork team is like, because right now there's question marks. And, yeah. and tactically, Liam, though, the, the setup of Cork, like, I'm not sure what, what you would do, but like to me, um, like Cork are electric to watch. There's so much kind of pace and energy and excitement in the team, but just defensively, like they have to... I look at Dermot O'Sullivan that time to, on the sideline, and you wonder, like some of the, some of the, the defending, like the, just the old art of literally limiting your man, going with your man, like I... I know there's been a lot of talk about what to do with Mark Coleman. That like uh, even in last year's All Ireland final, if you were to kind of pick a defender, uh, ultra modern, skillful runner, uh, ball player that might actually fit against Keane Lynch, I would have I would have thought it's Mark Coleman. And if you want to, like as a man marker or someone who go with him, I'd be kind of going like, why not go man to man and actually play? If the further Keane Lynch drops, you're bringing a brilliant ball player like Coleman up the field where he's more of an attacking threat. And then let somebody else kind of do play that ball six role and sit in behind. But this idea that like Cork tactically last year, I thought they got it so wrong in the All-Ireland just with the basic idea of going, like defending, going with some of the Limerick players. So if they let them off again, they're, they're going to be beaten. But it's, it surely can't be within the likes of Tim O'Mahony, the size and range of his talent you know, to win individual battles um, and, and actually just take on Limerick as maybe as Galway did in the league. Like, take them on and try and beat them rather than rely on a kind of system and running the ball out all the time. Because, like, I, ju- I just think, like, the talent, there's such talent in the team, surely. Like, Waterford just put through them through the middle, but the, the goals were criminal at times. Um, so yeah, I no, know, I agree. Like, uh, them, no, I, I agree, I agree. You know, but it was, you know, it was down the middle. I mean, I think mm. if... if 
if Kieran Kingston could go into the transfer market, he'd buy he'd, he'd buy Tyke de Burke in a heartbeat. He'd, he'd put him in there into into the spines of that defence. And I think they've got to find somebody that, you know, every time somebody looks to go down that central channel, that they're met with resistance from somebody that has a real presence. Um, you know, and I think right now they haven't managed to structure that uh, right. And I think if they, you know, if you're going to if you concede three or four goals to this Limerick team, you're in real trouble. But equally. Uh, Philip, they've got to bring a level. Like I know you mentioned pace, they have massive pace, but I question the energy at times of the forwards in terms of what they bring in terms of the tackling. I think you know if they let Limerick backs come out easy with ball and pick them off from distance, like they'll pick them off. Um, so I think in fairness, I, if I was in six backs, I'd be saying yes, we're looking at ourselves. But you know what? Now look in the mirror up there as well, because unless you start the defensive process higher up the pitch, I think they'll really struggle to deal with this Limerick forward line. Whereas if they do have that, it, that and I thought they had it in the league. So that's what I'm really interested to see now. What are they going to bring in a level of intensity across the pitch? Because they must be, like any group of players, they must be really feeling it coming out of the tournament that night. And I'm expecting to see a level of reaction that says this should make it a rip roaring contest. Yeah. The the other team in that match, Roy, obviously, were Waterford, who are um, seen as number one contenders, if, if not favourites, I think, by most. And that's going to require something of a sea change from their previous performances in the round robin because I looked at it today so I knew they were good but I wasn't sure they haven't won a game in a Munster round robin championship they've won draw and seven defeats in 2018 and 2019 which is astonishing now when you kind of match it against the the team they have now but obviously there's been a lot of change turnover there's a change of manager and everything else um so I think we're probably looking at them getting their first win of the Munster Round Robin Championship in Walsh Park on Saturday, on Sunday. Would, look, they're, they're, most people, there'll be most people's fancy to win the game, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a gimme. You know, uh, I would not, I would not have this down as straightforward. Like this, they will if they if they get their two points on Sunday, they'll be made to earn it. I mean. I, I find the conversation around Tipperary uh, peculiar. Like, I know, look, look, there has been a, you talk about sea change, there has been a shift in Tipperary in terms of personnel. They've lost some big players, big leaders, whether it's Paddy or Brendan. Obviously, Shamey now looks like he's out potentially for maybe the season. They don't know. It's a severe, it's a serious enough hand injury by all accounts. And, but look, there's like, there's, you know, there's plenty of hurlers in Tipperary. They, and it's probably now about time that the Jake Morrises and the Jason Fords now become the leaders. And, and, and you know, and I, and I, think, I, think, Jay, I think Jason Ford is there, really, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but but they, 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 look, I, 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 you're, you're going to need new leadership. You're going to need new lads to step up. I think they'll have, they, Tipperary have plenty of talent. I don't, I don't think that they're going to be found wanting for that. Um, and I think Waterford's obviously spring campaign has created a level of expectation, which will bring pressure in and in, in and of itself as well. So I think it's a slippery one on Sunday uh, for Liam Cahill. Uh, he'll know. I mean, like, is it spoken about in opposition dressing rooms when one of your own is the manager of the opposition? I'd certainly be mentioning it if, if I was in the dressing room. So um, I do, I like, I, look, you'd expect Waterford to get their campaign up and running. It would be a major, major setback if they didn't. But the fact that it would be a major setback means I do think it brings a level of pressure that maybe some of these Waterford players aren't used to. They're, they're not exactly used to dealing with the tag of favourites. And that's, that brings its own challenges. Yeah. Um, Liam, the, the the mood music around Tipperary or outside, it might be great in Tipperary, but outside Tipperary it hasn't, you know, people haven't been, people aren't considering them as as contenders. I think they're 12 to 1 with the bookies for the All-Ireland, which is quite astonishing in itself, um, considering where they, where they have been in the last couple of years. Ticket sales, reportedly, not as brisk as some might have expected. But you know as well as anyone that, okay, they've lost a couple of huge players through injury and retirement and they needed to lose Shane McCallan to a hand injury, like they needed a hole in the head. But you know as well as anybody, the talent that is coming through there and you were, 
as you explained to us here previously, you were in the process of kind of blooding these guys as best you could while, you know, sticking with your best 15 for the last couple of years. Um, so, you know, there's talent there and they needed an opportunity. Well, hey, presto, like, here's the opportunity, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, no, no question. Uh, it certainly is the opportunity. But, you know, in fairness, um, Colm has been dealt, you know, it's a huge blow. I mean, look, OK, aside, like Paulie, Brendan and, and Seamus has been, they've been incredible um you know, incredible players, incredible warriors, incredible, you know, delivering on the big stage like those three have done it, but they don't owe the county anything. I think, you know, it's probably and, and likewise, you know, Bubbles has been since since he really arrived on the scene, you know, um in the in the mid two thousand, you know, in two thousand and thirteen. And from then on, like he's been a great like but like John O'Dwyer and Isla Mara, Willie Connors and Brian O'Mara are four that you would say would be in the top twenty if they were available on on um on, on Sunday. So that's probably the biggest part of the blow, um, because they're all you know like they they but but look, I they're not the headline right. grabbers, but at the same time no, they are. No, no, but at the same make time, the like, team you know, tick. Like, like 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 Niall O'Mara, John O'Dwyer, and Willie Connors were were exceptional in the All Ireland victory, um, and like Willie Connors came on in the, in as he like he he was a guy that every time he came on he delivered, and like the, his 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 contribution in the semi final was was immense, and his contribution in the final was immense. So those three are big. Losses and Brian O'Mara was outstanding in the Fitzgibbon Cup, um, you know, in, in the campaign, um, in in their win. Uh, so like they're they're four players. But having said that, Tipperary will put a really good team out and they'll have backup because there's you know there's the the Connor Bowes, there's the Mark Shows, <coughs> there's the Jake Morris's, there's the Craig Morgan's, like there's the Robert Burns, there's Dylan Crooks, like there's there's a lot of guys that have had really good success at minor and underage level, um, and now it's there now some of those are going to get their opportunity and. You know, it's it's not an easy place to go, but at the same time, going down with overall low expectation, where if everybody, you know, if you ask nine people out of ten, they'll say home win. That's all they'll do. And mm. other you might meet one optimist and say, well, it's temporary. And it is temporary, and it is championship. And generally, Tip and Walford are competitive. So if I was Conor Bonner, we're saying, we can stick in this game and get this and get the clock up to 60, 65, and we're still in the game. Well, then, you know, maybe that pressure that Rory spoke about might might rise a little bit. So, um, yeah, look, you know, I... There's a lot of ambition about dressing room. There's a lot of really good players at a really good age, um, and I'm, I'm expecting Tip to come, to come. You know, be in the first round. It's a, it's it's a shot because at the end of the day they have a home match next week, which probably is going to be a big determinant. But I think they have a, they have a shot at this where the expectations are never as low. Okay, which is well, surprising. We're in danger of ignoring the Leinster Championship, which will go against the start of my conversation <laughs> yeah. here. So a quick quick prediction for who's going to win the Munster Championship outright. We'll start with you, Philip. I think like like the lads, your top three judging form and all known, uh, all known form so far this year. Kind of Limerick, Waterford, Cork. So look, maybe maybe Waterford ahead of Limerick. Okay, Rory. I think Limerick will. I think Limerick will uh, win, win 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 Munster. I do. Okay, and Liam. Yeah, I go with Limerick. Yeah, okay. I still think. Uh, I'll balance it up. I'm gonna I'm gonna join Philip. I'm gonna go for go for Waterford. I'm a, I I I'm a man who studies the form. Um, right, the Leinster Championship league league league, league form. Well, it's, it's it's the only form I got to go on. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you know you know who had good league form for five sevenths of it. That was Wexford, and they're probably <laughs> there's probably the game of the Leinster Championship to begin with. Liam, um, it's a game I'm going to. I'm looking forward to it. I'm oh, yeah. I'm bringing my five year old and my three year old, so I don't know how much of it I will see, but um, I'm looking forward to it anyway. Um, this seems we've spoken a bit about Wexford already, kind of around about. We haven't really spoken much about Galway, and Galway have kind of because they weren't in the latter stage of the league. It's kind of gone quiet, and they were definitely the team everyone was talking about at the start of the league because of who their manager is. And obviously, Henry's had some personal tragedy, which meant he kind of wasn't around for the latter stages of the, of the league as well. Um, but you know, this is this is a this is a massive game. These are two teams who would consider themselves all Ireland contenders, all things being equal. Uh, playing a first round game that will obviously the winner of this game is will be not sitting pretty, but be feeling pretty confident about making an all Ireland quarter final, if not a Leinster final. Oh yeah, listen, this is this is a massive match. Um, you know, Wexford League form in the in the league stages was outstanding, and obviously came on stuff in the semi final. You know, but um, at the same time, you know, there's no there's no team probably going to go to the league without a blip form of, of some sort. So, um, yeah, massive game, and like Henry's bringing a team down. But I suppose if there's one person that has a knowledge of 
going into Wexford Park and big championship matches and trying to get results. Henry Shefflin has all that all that experience, and I think he drawn it. And actually, it was interesting. He referenced, you know, when he was done when he did his interview for the Limerick and Galway match. He said, "Coming down to Limerick to play Limerick is a really great opportunity for us to experience." and set us up for the experience we're going to have when we walk into Wexford Park in the first round of the championship. And, you know, we all know what they walked away with that day. So, we're in for a crack and match. Uh, Wexford will have Lee Chin back. I'm sure they'll have all their, their, their big guns out. Dara has got some really nice young talent like Oshin Pepper and others coming through as well. So, he's building he's building nicely down there. Uh, this is an intriguing clash. And, like, the losers, as you say, Mike, he's going to be under real pressure. So, um, you know, it's it's there'll be some atmosphere down there. And if if if, uh, if I had two guys the matches on Saturday, that no, if I chase some matches early, no, that's exactly where we'd want to be. It's a big cracking game. Cracking yeah. game. Phil, what, what are you hearing out of Galway? Because it, it has been quite quiet. Are they, um, there's, well, they're Galway, so they, they, they won't be lacking for confidence. But, um, you know, there was kind of, there was kind of a mixed bag, I suppose, in terms of the early stages of the league. Um, Henry hadn't, you, there, there was the sense he'd kind of begin to put his stamp on the team in terms of mentality, etc. But do, do you really think, you're seeing uh, a Henry Shefflin team in terms of style of play yet? It's It's been hard, I must say, like obviously with the personal tragedy and that, it, it's made it very, very difficult. I think Henry was only finding his feet. Um, there was such a buzz, clearly. I think he's so well regarded. There was such a buzz when he came in and it, it was very much a unifying feeling for the county. You know, there was a tricky transition process there. Um, so I I think it's been a it's been hard just as he was finding his feet. I think we saw the the best of them in that um, Limerick game. Like physically, they're one. I know one of the very few teams in the country physically who can match up. You look at themselves in Waterford, who can go toe to toe with Limerick. Like Limerick, you nearly judge every team now by by how you're going to play potentially against Limerick. And I watched them the previously down Salt Hill in the league and they did the very same thing, went physically toe-to-toe and um, took on that battle, which a lot of teams try and avoid and and managed to come out the right side. But just their form is a bit of an enigma then. I think they were very flat after that. Obviously, it's been a disrupted build-up and the worry, I know there's kind of low expectations um, a little bit ago. I think people are prepared to kind of allow the new management team bed in and kind of give it time and and which is unusual, kind of in a way, for Galway, but it says that nobody's quite sure where their their form is, you know. Yeah. So, um, it's it's a it's a big test. I think that obviously Henry being on the sideline, and we're waiting for obviously the Kilkenny match will be first first of May. Image. Yeah, yeah. yeah May first. <laughs> so, yes. I was actually thinking about it there, Phil. I was going to say, <laughs> is will it be like do you know that scene in Star Wars when Luke Skywalker finds out Darth Vader is his father? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know um, but so look like everybody's looking ahead to that like this the, the master and apprentice ah, and yeah. you know so uh, but like like as Liam said Henry knows to get a team championship ready what he achieved with Bally Hale was remarkable because we, I think anybody we all know how difficult management is it doesn't matter what team you take and he back to back all Ireland clubs yeah, yeah. so and he, he made it look so simple so um mm. look uh, like the, the, the two of them it really will this is kind of going to set I think set their season up and, and set their set the whole championship up. The, the, the Leinster champion I was just looking there as well Mikey the 21st of May is a fan like I know um, obviously it kicks off this weekend Saturday Wexford Galway will be a big one but um, on the 21st of May, Kilkenny play Wexford, Galway play Dublin, which would obviously mean the three into four situation could be resolved. But you also have Leash against Westmead, which would probably decide who goes down. So that'd be very, very interesting evening, six o'clock in three different venues. And we might all need the calculators out again. I'd say. Oh God, it's just I yeah. thinking back to that day. Yeah, that was. That, that was <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Don't need another one of those. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. lads, we're just about done, so we'll just get predictions yeah. then for the Leinster Championship. Liam, oh, Kilkenny for me. I think they've really turned the corner, and I, I think they're contenders. I really do. Okay, Philip. Yeah, Kilkenny. I think they've they've changed. I saw them against Tipperary, and I think. Um, in the league and I thought it was probably the worst half of hurling mm. the two counties have ever produced and then both of them transformed like Kilkenny the following week um, I saw them in Parnell Park and they were absolutely transformed Mikey Butler is a dinger of a cornerback um, and David Blanchfield wing back like they're, they're far more comfortable with their possession kind of running game they're 
and the options they have. So I think they've been transformed in the space of the league. So they look the standout team in, in Leinster. Rory? I've, I think if Wexford get the win on Saturday night, I'm going to go for Wexford. I think they're a real momentum team. We all know <clears throat> the support, the size of the support, and you know the craziness that accompanies Wexford Hurling when it gets on a roll. I think if they can win Saturday night, I'd fancy Wexford to go and win Leinster. Who am I to argue with you, Roy? Who am I to argue with you? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you can watch the two Munster matches on Sunday on RTE2 and the RTE player, and there'll be coverage of all the Leinster and the um, Munster Hurling matches and Joe McDonough on Saturday and Sunday Sport on Radio 1, and we'll have reports on Munster, Leinster, Joe McDonough, live blogs, all the rest on the RTE website and the RTE News app. So I'll just say thank you to Liam and to Philip and to Rory, the chief supporter of the Wexford Hurling team. He's my friend forever now. <laughs> and we'll catch you all on Monday to have a look back on what has happened. Good luck. See you. Thanks, Thanks, bud. Thanks Mikey. From this, how much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by his home. Oh, and there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the bar. Oh, holy Moses.